Collins, can you please welcome to the stage? Well, thank you very much, Mark. And you're damn right, I want Chris Bowen's job. I wish they wouldn't keep changing on me. Uh, to my colleagues, Jane Prentice, who is here, over there, Jane, Steve Chobo, I'm heading down to his patch this afternoon, uh, Scotty Buchholz, who's doing a great job up there, Senator Brett Mason and Senator Sue Boyce, and if there's anyone else, I apologise. Uh, and to you, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for the warm welcome and the great attendance here. I have a very deep respect for the Fourth Estate and I appreciate being invited to the Queensland Media Club. Well, in the last 24 hours, I've learned a new party trick from Kevin Rudd. It's fantastic. <laughs> Yesterday, Mr Rudd gave a speech where he promised nothing more than a group hug with Australian business and the ACTU and more meetings overseas. He mentioned buzzwords like productivity and competitiveness, but he promised no timetables, no programs and no outcomes. He mentioned Tony Abbott 20 times, even though one Fairfax journalist said he hardly mentioned him at all. Of course, Mr Rudd didn't want to be negative or anything, but here is the catch. Mr. O Mr. Rudd's office then backgrounded selected journalists with what the journalists may have wanted to hear, briefing them supposedly on what Mr. Rudd actually meant in his speech. One journalist thought he committed to new coal seam gas rules in New South Wales. Another journalist thought he was supporting electricity privatisation in Queensland and New South Wales. Other journalists are still reporting Mr Rudd is going to increase the new start allowance, replace the fixed carbon tax with a floating carbon tax, invest in new infrastructure and still miraculously deliver Labor's first budget surplus on the current budget timetable despite a deteriorating economy. You see, it's a great party trick. How do you do all that? Well, Mr Rudd won't campaign on his record. Instead, he's campaigning off the record. Why? Because if he spoke on the record, then it binds him to these big promises. He either does not want to deliver promises on privatisation, tax cuts and bigger spending, or he can't actually deliver those promises. Mr Rudd wants to get credit for policies he never announces. Better still, he never actually delivers any of those policies he never announces. It's called plausible deniability because he never said what the journalists write down as his policy. I call it a Kevin Conjong. We've seen it all before, haven't we? This is the same old Kevin Rudd. Between 2007, and I want to refresh your memories for a brief moment. Between 2007 and 2008, Kevin Rudd launched a total of nine wars, including wars on drugs, inflation, unemployment, whaling, disadvantage, downloads, pokies, doping in sport, and he declared war on bankers' salaries. Not to be done with wars on everything, he promised two big revolutions, an education revolution, and not once, but six times, he promised a productivity revolution. So I'm not sure if the revolutions came before or after the wars, but the words are all flim-flam. He talks big, he runs a stunt every day, and he has no ticker for the hard decisions. That's why he's torn between reality, history and celebrity. Enough of the games, ladies and gentlemen. The people of Australia deserve better. Let's deal with the facts. There are serious economic headwinds facing Australia. Economic growth has been much weaker under Labor than under the Coalition. Real GDP growth averaged 3.6 per cent per annum under the Coalition and only 2.3 per cent under Labor. Growth is currently running at 2.5 per cent, significantly below trend and well below previous forecasts. Business conditions and capacity utilisation are at four-year lows. 
Given this soft growth performance, it should be no surprise that the economy is not generating sufficient employment to provide, provide jobs for everyone that wants to work. And as a result, the unemployment rate is increasing to 5.7 per cent, the highest rate in four years. So let's not keep blaming the GFC, the highest rate in four years. And youth unemployment is now 15 per cent. The budget papers forecast 5.5 per cent uh, for the unemployment rate by June this year. So that's another broken Labor promise. The uncomfortable fact is that there are now 700,000 Australians out of work who want jobs. Unemployment is now 200,000 higher than it was when Mr Rudd was Prime Minister first time around. In May 2011, the Labor government promised 500,000 new jobs over two years. Time's up and barely half the target number of jobs have been created. So it's failed to meet its own target on jobs growth. In contrast, the previous coalition government yet generated strong jobs growth and left the unemployment rate with a four in front of it. So the Prime Minister has no idea how to deal with these challenges. The coalition does. The core of our plan to grow the economy is to recognise that the private sector, that's you, not the government, is the one that creates investment, wealth and jobs. The coalition will remove the sand in the gears of the private sector to get out of the way so it can do more to generate prosperity for Australia. Reducing the burden of taxes and regulation, ensuring fair and competitive markets and reducing the size of government will boost business investment and spending. And from investment and spending will come growth and jobs. Firstly, under the coalition, the government will live within its means by returning the budget to surplus. And we will stabilise and repay the $340 billion of Labor debt. After promising only a temporary deficit in 2008, Mr Rudd's government has delivered the five biggest consecutive deficits in modern Australian history. From 2009 to 2013, the deficits have totaled $192 billion. The budget papers forecast two further deficits, totalling $29 billion, to take the cumulative amount of deficits under Labor to $220 billion. Labor does not project achieving a surplus until 2017, four budgets and two elections away. That's when they claim they're going to deliver their first budget surplus. Not this election, after the next election. Trust me, that's what they're saying. And uh, even then, all I hear is Mr Rudd talking about balancing the budget, not delivering a surplus. But then again, this government has never delivered a surplus. And I guarantee if they win the next election, Labor and Kevin Rudd will never deliver a surplus. It's not in their DNA to live within their means. And the core of Labor's budget woes is excessive spending. Labor splurged $88 billion on stimulus in response to the events of September and October 2008. We fully supported the first round of stimulus, but then Kevin Rudd's excesses took over and the waste began and we're still paying for it. In fact, Mr Rudd felt the need to have the third biggest stimulus package in the world after the United States and South Korea. But the waste was ridiculous. $27,900 checks were sent overseas, even though they were meant to stimulate our economy. 27000 And I suspect New Zealand is forever grateful. <laughs> What's more... $16,900 cheques went to dead people. Not even Kevin Rudd could get them to spend the money in time. <laughs> Mr Rudd spent $2 billion to put pink bats in people's roofs and then spent nearly half a billion dollars to take them out. And all with a tragic loss of four Australian lives. Mr Rudd spent $16 billion on overpriced school halls. It was meant to cost around $14 billion. And even as recently as last month, 
there were still 31 primary school projects which had not been completed five years after the global financial crisis. The Prime Minister says that Australia has a low level of debt. The facts are that the government debt has risen in every year of the Labor government and will continue to increase in every year of the next four years. The increase in debt under the Labor government uh, the first five years has been the fastest both in dollar terms and as a share of GDP in modern Australian history. So they've built up debt faster than anyone else. Anyone else. The last time Mr Rubb was Prime Minister, he was borrowing well over $100 million a day. Now he's borrowing an additional $49 million every single day. By the end of this year, Labor will have increased debt by over $220 billion since its election in 2007. And because it didn't trust itself, it had a debt limit. And they first set the debt limit at $75 billion and said it would never go above that. Then they set it at $200 billion. No, we're not going above that. $250 billion. No, don't worry, we're not going above that. $300 billion. No, don't worry, we're not going above that. And we drew the teeth out of the crocodile at Treasury and Senate estimates and we find that it's going to go up to well over $300 billion. In fact, Treasury said the gross debt will be $290 billion by Christmas this year. The expected peak is $340 billion, but that's Oz of today. And this debt, as you know, with your mortgages and your businesses, it has to be repaid, it has to be serviced. The interest alone is $13 billion a year, $35 million a day in interest. And the annual interest cost is more than enough to cover the full year costs of the National Disability Insurance Scheme. The total interest bill, by the way, would cover the construction of 10 brand new teaching hospitals every year in Australia. Just the interest, just the interest on the government's debt. And overwhelmingly, most of that interest is going overseas because most of that debt is held overseas. Yesterday, the Prime Minister did not announce any new initiatives to balance the budget or repay the debt. And the chaotic state of the budget doesn't seem to be any concern of his. It's of concern to us. We will put the nation's finances back on a sustainable course. We've done it before. We'll climb the mountain again. And we'll do this by eliminating waste and unnecessary spending, not by raising taxes. And we've already announced significant savings, totalling well over $15 billion, including abolishing the $1 billion per year school kids bonus. It's not popular, but it's the right thing to do because it's borrowed money. We're borrowing from our children to hand it over to parents. And we said we're going to reduce the public service headcount by 12,000 through natural attrition over two years because it's increased by 20,000 since Kevin Rudd was first elected, even though he said that he wanted to take a meat axe to the public service. It's increased by 20,000. We're rephasing the increase in the superannua ga superannuation guarantee from 9% to 12% by two years. We're not proceeding with a low-income superannuation contribution. We're reducing the humanitarian refugee intake from 20,000 back to 13,750. And we're abolishing the $10 billion Clean Energy Finance Corporation. And Labor says, you don't make any announcements. Well, here they are. We've done it before. We've said it and we're saying it again. We have to make these decisions. Because there is no benefit. There is no benefit to the nation unless you are prepared to do the hard yards and make the decisions that leaders should make. And we will announce further substantial savings before the election. And I can assure you that all our policy initiatives will be fully costed and fully funded. And I expect the same standards from the government, although they haven't yet given that commitment because they're still writing their policies. The Labor government has constantly resorted to new and increased taxes to plug their budget black holes. The Prime Minister has not announced any plans to reduce the burden of taxation. The Coalition will act quickly to reduce the burden of tax by immediately abolishing the $9 billion per year carbon tax and the mining tax, which as of today seems to raise a mysterious amount of money. The carbon tax has raised costs for both households and businesses. It's fed directly into higher electricity and gas prices and a higher cost of living for every Australian. It must 
go. The mining tax is an impost on our most successful export sector, and no economy ever won the economic race by handicapping its best performers. But we will keep the personal income tax cuts and fortnightly pension increases because we understand the intense pressure families are under with the cost of living. We've also announced a white paper reform process for real tax reform that will lay down a new tax agenda for the Australian people's approval at the subsequent election. Of course, our opponents will never tell you about their new taxes, carbon tax being the most spectacular example. 39. 39 of which they've introduced or increased since Mr Rudd was first elected in 2007. We have a plan. Ladies and gentlemen, productivity growth is a key driver of a prosperous economy. At the end of the day, it is the level of a nation's productivity that determines the standard of living for our citizens. And we're proud of our record on productivity. Labor productivity growth was about half of one percentage point higher under the last coalition government than it is under Labor. And that is a fact. Where Mr Rudd got his facts from yesterday, we can't quite work out. I suspect he can't either. Unlike our opponents, we'll take concrete steps to boost productivity. And as a great relief to you, we'll not be asking everyone to hold hands and sing Kumbaya, which is Mr Rudd's preferred policy development process. Well, I suppose the 2020 summit was a screaming success, wasn't it? Tony Abbott and I and the coalition team have a six-point plan for productivity growth. And this week, uh, we released a 30-page plan to boost productivity and, importantly, reduce regulation. In the 2007 election, Mr Rudd promised, he promised this, that for every new regulation, an old regulation would be removed. Well, that was a screaming success. In six years under Labor, they've removed 1,000 regulations. Well, well done, Labor. The problem is they've introduced 21,000 new regulations. So what we've said is we will reduce the burden of regulation on business by a billion dollars a year through reducing red and green tape. We will cut excessive regulation by reforming the process through which new regulations are created, implemented and reviewed will repeal costly and excessive regulations. My colleague Matthias Cormann has already talked about a number of the areas such as FOFA and others where we will get rid of the detailed regulation. The remuneration of senior public servants in Canberra will be linked to the quantified and proven reduction in regulation. We will have a one-stop shop for environmental approvals which will cover both state and federal obligations. And that's an idea so welcome that Mr Rudd plagiarised it yesterday. Yeah. We'll set aside, importantly, two parliamentary sitting days each year simply for the repeal of legislation and regulations. And we're not going to sit around twiddling our thumbs, I can promise you. The Coalition will make Australian workplaces better by improving the fair work laws to provide a stable, fair and prosperous future. Our plan will ensure that the fair work laws provide a strong and enforceable safety net for workers while helping business to grow, create new jobs and deliver high real wage growth. Under a coalition government, the paying condition of workers will be protected. We believe in reward for effort. We believe in protecting jobs. We also understand the need for healthy businesses to create opportunities for workers to get ahead and ensure no one's left behind. Our industrial relations plan, which has been released, includes improving the fair work laws and improving the independent umpire. We'll provide better protection for members of registered organisations. We guarantee workers have the right of access to fair flexibility. We ensure union right of entry provisions are sensible and fair, and they promote harmonious, sensible and productive enterprise bargaining and we ensure workplace bullying is comprehensively addressed. We ensure the laws work for everyone through an independent review by the respected Productivity Commission. We will urgently review the Remuneration Tribunal for the trucking industry and implement many recommendations from the Fair Work Review Panel. And importantly for the building industry, we'll re-establish the Australian Building and Construction Commission with all of its resources and powers 
which will eliminate some of the industrial thuggery that we are seeing on building sites around Australia and will boost productivity in the construction industry, which is so vital. So we're going to restore a sensible balance uh, on fair work and we'll give workplaces, businesses and workers the hope that tomorrow will be better with a stable job and well remunerated job. Another way to improve output and productivity is to increase participation in the workforce. We'll implement a suite of measures to live workforce participation. Our paid parental leave scheme will encourage more highly skilled women to remain in the workforce while they have families. And Australia continues to have a comparatively low level of ongoing female participation in the workplace, and that is a significant cost to our economy. Our policies to provide a subsidy to employers to hire and retain mature Australians will help keep experience and wisdom in the workforce. And our policies for unemployed young Australians will assist labour mobility and encourage them to go to where the work is. Getting people working for good and working for the common good is good for the economy. Australia needs to build more roads, freight rail, ports and other infrastructure. We need to remove the bottlenecks that stifle our industry and waste our time on the daily commute. The Coalition will get Australia moving <clears throat> and we'll work in partnership with our state colleagues in that regard. We'll help build Melbourne's east-west link. and We've committed $1.5 billion to that. We're committing a further $1.5 billion to Sydney's West Connect, as well as a billion dollars here in Brisbane to the Gateway motorway upgrade. We'll have more to say on the Toowoomba Range crossing, Adelaide's South Road, Tasmania's Midland Highway. We will duplicate the Pacific Highway within a decade. We'll also build key roads in Perth, and we'll have more to say about the Bruce Highway in the not-too-distant future. We will build a national broadband network for $60 billion less than Labor and will still deliver the internet speeds you need sooner. Yesterday, the Prime Minister mentioned there was a priority list of projects which have been subject to cost-benefit analysis. But then he failed to mention that the biggest of them all, the MBN, was never subject to a cost-benefit analysis. The project the National Broadband Network, which Kevin Rudd devised, is in meltdown, with open warfare between the board and its chief executive. It's behind schedule and it's had massive cost blowouts. But don't worry, Kevin Rudd did his own cost-benefit analysis of the $90 billion project on the back of a beer coaster on his VIP government jet. That's fact. I'm not making it up. I'm just reminding you that it is fact. The Coalition will ensure uh, that the spending delivers value for taxpayers' money. All infrastructure projects with a value over $100 million will be subject to a full cost-benefit analysis. And, ladies and gentlemen, small business is the engine room of the economy. But Labor has had five small business ministers in two years. Five small business ministers in two years. We believe you deserve better. We aim to double the rate of small business growth in Australia if elected. Scrapping the carbon tax, cutting regulation, building better infrastructure, that will all help. But we want to ease the paperwork burden by moving the administration of the National Paid Parental Leave Scheme from small business to the government's FAO. And we'll extend unfair contract protections to small business and we'll su simplify the administration of superannuation reporting. And we'll introduce a comprehensive pay-on-time or pay-interest policy for Commonwealth departments and agencies that owe small business money. And, and it is significant, we're going to bring small business into my portfolio of Treasury, which means it'll be at the heart of the decision-making of government. Ladies and gentlemen, we all want a cleaner, cleaner environment and we want lower emissions. But we want to achieve that without putting shackles on our economic prosperity through the imposition of the world's biggest carbon tax. We fully support reducing Australia's CO2 emissions by 5 per cent by 2020. But we'll do it through direct action, not by imposing a great big new tax on business and consumers. And it seems as though the Prime Minister might be having second thoughts about Labor's carbon tax. He may move to a floating scheme a year earlier. I know he was pretty quiet on this yesterday. Perhaps he's finally worked out that it's going to cost a lot of money. He'll actually make 
have to make some hard decisions about saving money to pay for it. In any case, a lower tax will still be a tax, whether it's fixed or floating, and it still can be jacked up after the election. These sorts of policy fiddles will not fool the Australian people. We are clear. The coalition is clear. The carbon tax will go altogether, and our direct action plan, and a similar plan has been embraced by President of the United States and most other countries. Our direct action plan will deliver the results. Last Friday, Tony Abbott announced the coalition's plan for a green army of environmental workers, 15,000 strong, to provide real and practical solutions for cleaning up our waterways and natural environment. These are the direct actions that will help reduce emissions at home and achieve a cleaner environment. And ladies and gentlemen, a modern economy needs an efficient and competitive financial services system. Under Labor, competition in banking has been reduced. For retail customers, the market share of bank housing loans outstanding to the big four banks has increased from 75 per cent to 85 per cent. At a wholesale level, a number of major international banks have reduced their presence in Australia. In October 2010, I proposed a nine-point plan to lift competition in financial services. And obviously, it was a pretty good plan because Labor stole most of the initiatives. But if we win government, we will have a son of Wallace or granddaughter of Campbell root and branch review of the financial system. And what I have in mind is a wide perspective look at where we want the financial system to be over the next decade. And I think, importantly, how we want Australia to fund itself as a nation over the next decade and the steps that we need to take to get there. And the financial world has changed a lot since the GFC. And as the Reserve Bank identified only this week, there have been competitive, there have been changes in the competitive structure of the financial industry and financial services industry. There's been closer integration of financial markets across the globe. There has been the near failure of banking systems in key developed economies. There's been a renewed push for tighter controls from global regulators. And there's been massive advancement in technology. All of these factors have changed the way financial services interacts with the economy. We need to have an overarching plan to deal with that. And I can promise you the wisdom and knowledge does not come through the air conditioning in either the Treasury or Parliament House in Canberra. So the financial system inquiry is going to lay out a roadmap in partnership with stakeholders. If we want to expand the opportunities for Australian business, if we want to create more jobs and have uh, a stronger economy, we need to get the balance right in relation to our relations in the region. With foreign investment of such critical importance to Australia, we must continue to remove impediments to the free flow of goods, services and capital. We must foster closer relation with our neighbours. We will boost trade in food by opening up and developing more agriculture in northern Australia, and only the coalition will do that. We will broaden the economic relationship with Asia to include services such as education and health and financial services. And we will finalise free trade agreements with key Asian neighbours to more closely integrate us into the zone. And we will establish a new two-way Colombo plan to enable the best and brightest for our region to build relationships and learn in each other's countries. And the coalition has announced will increase the study of foreign languages in schools with an emphasis on Asian languages. And crucial for our relationships in the region is the protection of our borders. The Labor government and Kevin Rudd have lost control of our borders. The boats keep coming and the people smugglers are getting richer. It is the single greatest policy and financial failure of Kevin Rudd. But there was not even a mention of it by Mr Rudd yesterday. Perhaps that is not surprising. It's a policy failure because Mr Rudd got it wrong when he abandoned the proven policies of the Howard government. The pull factor of what is essentially an open-door policy by Australia is encouraging thousands of people to risk their lives on leaky boats. Since Kevin Rudd changed the laws, 46,000 people have come by boat to Australia. 
and the flow is continuing at 100 arrivals a day. If Kevin Rudd is re-elected, that means 100,000 over the next three years. Each boat costs Australian taxpayers $13 million. Boat arrivals are the most costly policy failure in Australian history, with a blowout to taxpayers now approaching $12 billion. $12 billion. The Coalition's message to the government is that it won't be rhetoric that stops the boats. Only re by returning to the proven policies of the Howard government will finally put the people smugglers out of business and stop this great tragedy, this human tragedy. The Coalition will turn back the boats where it's safe to do so. We will reintroduce temporary protection visas. There will be a presumption against refugee status for boat arrivals transiting through Indonesia who lack identity papers. There will be tougher minimum sentences for people smugglers with mandatory non-parole periods. We will have fair income offshore processing and it will be the coalition and only the coalition that stops the boats. Ladies and gentlemen, these are just some of the detailed plans the coalition has been working on for Australia's future. Just some of them. The Labor Party keeps saying we've got no plans and then they criticise us about the plans that we've announced. Our economic plan is to build a more prosperous and more secure Australia, a stable and trustworthy Australia. The Prime Minister had an opportunity yesterday to lay out his plans for Australia, but all we got was self-congratulation and promises, promises for more talking and group hugs, no policies, no outcomes. The only concrete policies we had from the recycled Prime Minister have been policy announcements on new procedures for voting for the parliamentary leader of the Labor Party. Even then, his proposal looks as though it's being watered down. With Kevin Rudd, you buy a beer and you get a shandy. <laughs> the Treasurer is not any better. All he's done is launch his book, which tells us Labor should not have got into bed with the Greens. He wants a divorce, but he's still in the marriage. Seriously, who cares about the Labor Party? Australians want a government that cares about them, about their families and about their jobs and their businesses. That's what Australians want. What's coming out of Canberra, what's coming out of Kevin Rudd is all self-indulgent, inwardly focused flim-flam. And it shows Labor only cares for itself with no regard for the responsibilities of governing the country. The Labor Party's playing the fiddle and Rome is burning. Nothing's changed. The spending is still out of control, the debt is still climbing, unemployment is still rising, a carbon tax and a mining tax are still in place, the economy is weakening and the boats are still coming. Much has been said, but nothing has been delivered. Ladies and gentlemen, Strong communities do not need celebrities as leaders. Australia does not need Kevin Kardashian as Prime Minister. <laughs> we need an experienced and united team to govern the country that focuses on good policy, not Facebook likes. At the end of the day, the choice for Australians is very simple. A vote for the same old Kevin Rudd is still a vote for the same old rotten Labor Party. Can our nation really cope with another three years of Labor? Well, the only way to get rid of Labor is to vote for the Coalition, because we're the ones that you can trust. We're the stable ones. We have predictable policies, no more wild rides, and that's why we will restore the hope, the reward and the opportunity that the Australian people deserve and the Australian people expect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Joe's kindly agreed to stay up on the stage uh, 
for some uh, for some questions. We might start with a few journos, and there's a pretty gr good crowd here today, so um, we might throw to the floor for some questions. If you can just sort of keep your questions brief and say where you're coming from, uh, where you're from, sorry, and where you're coming from as well, perhaps. Um, I, uh, I might start off myself uh, with a quick question. Obviously, we'll get to the inevitable questions about election timing and the like. But I first, obviously, uh, the coalition and, and certain sections of the media have run a pretty strong campaign against the NBN. Mike Quigley's announced today that he's riding off into the sunset. What's your response to that? Do you, do you think, uh, Mal your good friend Malcolm Turnbull tweeted before saying, name any uh, company that succeeded when the CEO has quit. Do you think that it's still a viable and who would you put up as a replacement? Uh, well, it's no surprise. Uh, and I didn't know that before I actually pointed out that there was a breakdown between the board and the chief executive, so... It's a pretty major one, no? You can just assume that everything else in the speech is right as well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, that's a matter for the board, but the, the NBN has been a debacle from day one. I think Kevin Rudd promised in 2007 that it cost around $4 billion. Well, we're still waiting. And the best industry estimates that we can get illustrate, uh, you know, concern that it's going to get to $90 billion. $90 billion. If it's rolled out. And it's got all the problems, you know, just as there were pink bat problems in, and, you know, terrible tragedies associated with the pink bats, now we've got terrible circumstances arising with asbestos in the pits in the NBN. Labor doesn't know how to implement policy. It doesn't know how to do it. It's got the big grandiose gestures, but they don't know how to run an economy. They don't know how to run a business. And what a surprise, because none of them have ever run businesses. So what do you, is the NBM as, as a company viable with the direct action plan? Or do you think it needs to be overhauled and start again? With, with our policy, yes, it is. And Malcolm, we've released our broadband policy. It's a very very comprehensive policy and I urge you all to read it. Mm. Just, I might have one more quick question before we throw to the floor. Um, there was a talk about, uh, in Kevin Rudd's speech yesterday, about electricity prices. Obviously that's a, a pretty hot topic across the country. He was, wasn't uh, stupid enough to say that he could bring down electricity prices because I don't think any politician can, but he seemed to suggest that there would be uh, a bit of pressure being put on certain state governments to perhaps no. privatise electricity assets as a way to bring down power prices. What's your response to that? Uh, it's more bluff and bluster. I asked Chris Bowen on a morning TV this morning, do you support the electricity or private, uh, privatisation in Queensland and New South Wales? And he wouldn't answer the question. It's come as a surprise to Labor. But Kevin Rudd was backgrounding that, well, you know, we're going to privatise electricity in New South Wales and Queensland. Well, but he wouldn't say it. He was background, you know, it came through the media, through some journos, including, I think, one journo at your uh, august institution. I won't mention who it is. Yeah. But, uh, and, you know, they said, well, it's on, you know, the privatisation, electricity. But you see, Kevin doesn't want to actually say that because then he's held accountable and then it becomes a policy. And then he's held accountable to that policy and, oh, my goodness, I might have to deliver. And it could create division in the community. That's the thing. All talk. The only way to reduce electricity prices from what they're going to be is to get rid of the carbon tax. That's a starting point. That's a starting point. And, uh, you know, he just doesn't want to do that. Mm. OK, we might uh, throw to the floor. Has anyone got a question? Kim Aegis from Australian Associated Press. House sorry, sorry. Uh, Kim Aegis from oh, Australian course. Associated Press. Hello, um, housing figures have been strong for five months now. Um, has the RBA got the settings right? And secondly, um, before Kevin Rudd became Prime Minister, the focus in Queensland was how many, um, how many seats Labor would lose in the state. Now, how worried are you about the LNP losing marginal seats? Uh, well, I'll leave the commentary on seats to others, but we have outstanding members who are working damn hard for the community. And if you look at the mess that the Queensland LNP inherited from Labor, multiply it by four and think of what Australia would look like if Labor's re-elected and, and is there for the next three years. And I'd say to, say to Queenslanders, what I've discovered about Queenslanders is that they have a low tolerance threshold for people that are full of it. And Kevin Rudd is one of those. 
Is there a I'm not cheering you on in State of Origin, by the way. <laughs> Um, I think there's a question there about housing. Oh, yeah, housing, sorry. So, <laughs> you stay, get off the attack for one minute and no, answer the question on policy, would be nice. Just one minute. Um, uh, look, the thing about housing, it's so much is linked to confidence with housing. Uh, and the bottom line is, if people aren't confident enough about their jobs, they're not going to go and borrow money. And there's virtually no credit growth in Australia at the moment. Because people are sitting on their hands. They're nervous about job security. And why not? Because unemployment is rising, 5.7 per cent. And as I said, 200,000 Australians more unemployed today than when Mr Rudd came to government in 2007. And they're underemployed as well. There is very significant underemployment in Australia. So people are nervous. Therefore, they are not going to take the risk of borrowing money from the bank and going and buying a home. And therefore, what you are going to see is that we are not going to get back to the housing construction levels that we've had in the past until we have confidence back in the community. And one thing leads to another. That's how it works. The second thing is we've got to do more, and it's not particularly the case in Queensland, but in some of the other states, we've got to do more on land release. And the third thing is we've got to have quicker approval processes. And, you know, you're never going to have uh, speedy investment. Money travels fast these days, as it should, but it travels incredibly fast. And because money is global, it's a global exchange and it travels incredibly fast, and there are more things you can invest in today than ever before in the history of humanity. And you're more, it's more accessible from your lounge room and so on. There is not the same level of interest in housing investment as there once was, and there are alternatives. And what we've got to do is have pride in the fact that Australia is a great homeowning nation. And we've got to focus on the opportunities that come from, from home ownership, such as stability of community, uh, such as affordability for people who can't afford to buy a home, and therefore they rent, and accessibility to housing. And the market is, is, is a good market in housing. Government intervention is not something I encourage, but I'd say to you, you are never going to get further growth in housing until you get some confidence back into the community so that people have the confidence to go down the bank and borrow some money. It's not going to change under Labor. OK, I think we've got another question there. Yeah. Um, Ray Wilson from APN. Um, what can regional Queensland voters expect from a coalition government in power? And can you tell us a little bit more about your commitment to fixing the Bruce Highway? Uh, you'll hear about the Bruce Highway in due course. It's not for me to make announcements uh, here, but I, had, I drove the Bruce Highway not long ago, actually. Uh, and uh, uh, I understand where people are at about parts of the Bruce Highway, not all of it. There's some upgrades going on at the moment. In relation to regional Australia, uh, I was at... Uh, Curry two weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, met with the Cattlemen's Association. Met, and what concerned me not just was where the cattle exports are at, and that is a, you know, what a terrible, terrible policy failure it was to close down the live cattle export industry overnight without warning. That was a complete unmitigated disaster. Complete unmitigated disaster not only for our relationship with Indonesia, but there is not one farmer in the Parliamentary Labor Party. Not a single farmer. And our ranks are full of farmers, from the National Party, the LNP, and even in the case of me, believe it or not, in far north Queensland. And I'd say to you, we understand that cattle and agricultural produce are not like normal widgets that you produce in a manufacturing plant. So when you make decisions like stopping the live cattle exports, it's a disaster. And we've been working closely with the Cattlemen's Association, even from opposition and others up there, to try and open up export markets into Papua New Guinea and try and reopen export markets into Indonesia. Uh, secondly, we will invest in the infrastructure necessary for regional Australia, and Bruce Highway is one, duplication of the Pacific Highway is another, but it's got to go beyond that. You've got to 
find ways to, to build opportunities in regional Australia. That means getting faster broadband or getting broadband out to those communities, not waiting for the cable to come by your house, but using a mix of technologies under our broadband plan to get fast broadband out to those communities as quick as possible. And ultimately, I'd say to you, at the highest levels of a coalition government, regional Australia will have a seat. It'll have a seat, which it doesn't have under Labor. There'll be people at the top of the tree who actually understand regional Australia, care about regional Australia, live in regional Australia. And that'll be the defining difference between us and Labor. Is there any other questions from journalists? I think we've got Mr Bruce. Uh, Jeff Bruce from Seven News, Mr Hockey. Um, Bruce. I don't know whether you've bumped into Mr Abbott while he's been in town today, but it's relatively unusual to see the two of you here. Um, back to Kim's question earlier, do you think that Kevin Rudd's re-elevation is going to make it more difficult for the Coalition to win more seats in Queensland? Well, uh, you know, there's, a, there's an immediate interest in the celebrity factor, the bright, shiny object. And that's not just a reflection off the rim of his glasses. But you've got to look behind it all. And Australians will. I'm absolutely confident that when Australians think carefully about it, they will not re-elect Labor for another three years like the three years we've just had, or the six years we've just had. I'm absolutely confident about that. Queenslanders can see through fakes. And ultimately, Kevin Rudd is a fake. Okay, I think there's another question there. Did I miss him? <laughs> Sally Prosser here from the ABC. And sorry, just on uh, Tony, Tony Abbott and I don't sit down over a, you know, a beer and compare diaries. It's, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll say publicly I'm back here Thursday, Friday next week, so uh, in case he wants to compare the diary. I'm, we're always up here, as we should be. Sorry, ma'am. Sally Prosser from the ABC. You spoke a lot about increasing productivity, so would you commit to a 2% productivity growth target? And if so, how? Well, I'd ask you to look firstly at our record. Oh, well, I just gave what I thought was a pretty comprehensive plan on how, uh, but I can give you another opportunity. I'm not going to say, I'm not 2%. Look, we'll, we can do better. The Coalition can do better than 2% because we have in the past, right? So. That's the starting point, but you know I'm not going to get into the, 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 the you know the targets that uh, Mr. Rudd set because I'd like to hear how he's going to do it, which would be interesting. But from my perspective, number one, you've got to spend money on infrastructure, and I've already announced that you know re-announced uh, what we're going to spend on the Gateway project, on West Connects, on the East West, all the money committed. <clears throat> number two, you need to have sensible changes. Uh, in the workplace laws that bring things back without changing the fair work laws so that I don't get verbal by our good friends in the union movement. And that includes having a strong Australian Building and Construction Commission, uh, which will help to bring some productivity benefits back into the construction industry. Uh, number three, we're going to get rid of the red tape and the duplication. I mean, Kevin Rudd can't even manage, and Labor can't even manage the relationship between the state governments and the Commonwealth government on, on Gonski, let alone try and have in place a single environmental approval regime. Uh, and that's what we are going to do. And Tony Abbott announced it months ago and re-announced it again on Monday. And Kevin said it yesterday uh, as if it had just come down as a thought bubble to him. And number four, we are going to uh, get rid of the red tape and green tape a billion dollars a year with the dedicated event of Parliament sitting for the first time to repeal legislation and repeal regulation. And the starting point is 21,000 that Labor introduced most recently. Uh, number five, we're going to focus on workforce participation, hugely important, including the PPL scheme. Uh, that's, that's part of the equation. Uh, and uh, and uh, you need to increase workforce participation if you're going to improve productivity. And number six, you need to help to get people off welfare and back into work. And we believe in mutual obligation and we believe in work for the dollar. And how important that is. The 
Children don't get caught in that trap of seeing their parent unemployed or parents unemployed and they end up unemployed. You remember those days? Well, our work for the dog got rid of that. But it's coming back. And youth unemployment at 15 per cent is one of the most alarming statistics and it keeps going up and it's going up under Labor. Therefore, you've got to have that mutual obligation, which is hugely important, and that's part of our productivity plan as well. Joe, just a quick one on infrastructure. Obviously, if you're going to be the, the person controlling the purse strings if the Coalition wins the election whenever it's held, um, no money for Brisbane's Cross River Rail project. It's, it was the number one project put forward by the Liberal National Party government up here. Um, Tony Abbott's been pretty uh, yeah. defiant in the fact that not supporting, not wanting, no, not committing any money to any urban rail yeah. projects. Is that because there's no money, or has Tony had no, a bad no, experience it... on a passenger train? That's why. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Sydney trades are only just getting better. Um, look, uh, you know, there's a temptation. It's easy to say Commonwealth government get involved in rail, right? But you know, it's just never about Commonwealth government getting involved in urban rail, metropolitan rail. It's about Commonwealth Government setting up a new bureaucracy in Canberra that then starts to second-guess the state on that rail. And then they want to know what the zoning laws are around the railway track and they want to know uh, what the integration is with the bus routes and they want to know what the traffic flows are going to be and they want to know everything. We don't want Canberra second-guessing everything that happens in the states. In fact, we want to get rid of a whole lot of that. So you don't have thousands of employees in the Department of Health that doesn't treat one patient. And you don't have thousands of people in a Department of Education in Canberra that doesn't teach one pupil. So we don't want thousands more people in the Department of Transport in Canberra that are involved in redesigning the public transport systems in our cities. And we've made the decision that is not for us that is not for us. We will commit to supporting road projects because that's where the Commonwealth has been now for a number of years. And we'll support other infrastructure projects. But please, the state governments are elected to do their job. You elected them, the same people. You elected them. Let them do their job without any second guessing out of Canberra. We could always just give them the money and let them look after putting it to you. Well, I'm more precious about taxpayers' money, even though even though we have a great state government here in Queensland. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a great deal of respect for my good friend Tim Nichols, <laughs> yeah. but there's no blank cheques. My, um, I have respect for taxpayers' money. I know how damn hard it is to earn money and pay tax. You know, I come from a family of small business people. I've worked in business and I have a great deal of respect for taxpayers' money and there's no blank cheques out of a government that I'm part of. Mm. Look, I think we might have to leave it there. So, can, ladies and gentlemen, can you please thank uh, Joe Hockey once again? Thank you. Thanks again for coming again today, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to uh, a visual recording of today's speech, you can go to the uh, Queensland Media Club website. Yeah. If you want to see Joe at more, you know, too much Joe is not enough. But you can visit the website to keep informed of other upcoming speakers and dates or download past speeches. I would once again like to thank uh, naming rights sponsors Brisbane Airport Corporation, Civil Contractors Federation and Griffith Uni, as well as other sponsors. Um, if you'd like to receive information...